All right, guys, welcome back into another episode of the Advisor Odyssey podcast. Now, there's generally two types of people, those who listen and those who don't. So today we're going to be talking about five power phrases and uh, powerful phrases, pardon me, five powerful phrases to drive that conversation and potential client sale forward. And then we're also going to be talking a lot about how to stop potentially losing clients to the advisor next door. And then lastly, when is too much when it comes to using softwares in your financial planning? So stay tuned, guys. we got a good episode. This is the Advisor Odyssey audio experience where financial advisors, planners, insurance agents, and brokers will find fresh new ideas and perspectives around what it takes to launch succeed, scale, and bulletproof their business. Now jumping in, I'm not sure this is for you, but here are five phrases to drive that conversation forward. Now these are from the book, The Art of Influence, and uh, I. so disclaimer, I stole them from there, but when we weave them into financial planning and meeting with clients and prospects, there is tremendous value in these. So I grabbed the five that I thought were some of the most powerful ones. Again, highly recommend you read this book if uh, if time allows and choose your own favorites. But jumping in, the first one is, I'm not sure if this is for you, but you might want to look at this. You know, that's the term. Now, the word but fires an influence, or I'm sorry, it fires an impulse through whomever's listening right? It sends that impulse and the brain automatically wants to negate everything that it formerly thought or that was said before. And that causes the belief that maybe this is for me. This is probably for me. I should pay attention to this, right? That's what it's going to do. So when you're in your doing, when you're talking through your marketing, right? Your podcast, your uh, radio, your TV show at your events, your webinars, whatever it is, dropping a line of saying, I'm not sure if this is for you, but that right there is going to draw people in. It's going to get them to lean forward. So I'm not sure if this is for you, but we do provide tax analysis to all of our clients and even those who meet with us for the first time. Right? Again, powerful phrase to use to drive that forward. Now, the second powerful phrase that I really like is really simple, and it's just, typically okay beginning any conversation or any sentence with typically right that's going to incite the belief that you've done this before as the advisor so when you're talking with clients and you're having situations about uh, or you're seeing situations about you know typically this is a tax write-off or typically we can get more social security for you than what you thought okay it incites that you've done that before. They feel more comfortable. And from the prospecting side, it'll do the same thing. Typically, people who meet with us save, you know, XYZ amount on taxes on average. Or typically, the people who come to one of these events, they end up leaving with a notebook full of information. Right? You're you're basically, you're pre-prepping the prospect or the client for what's about to come, whether it's really living up to the hype or not. But you're also instilling comfort into whomever that person is or those people who hear it because they know that whatever they might ask you to do or whatever they might expect you to do is something that you've done before even though they might not ever have. So that's going to make them feel more comfortable and more safe. You know, as elementary as this sounds, if you stand up in front of people and you say, you know, I don't run very many of these analysis, but I'm happy to provide one for you. Why? Why would someone want to do that? As opposed to, we run four or five of these every single week, and we'd be honored to provide you with one of these. Right? The language is powerful, but again, the word there is typically. So so the third phrase that I really like is, that's interesting. What makes you say that? Now, this becomes powerful in the actual sales situations. This is also a great way to overcome objections. Right, Whatever your objections are that you receive on a regular basis or maybe they're completely random and frequent, they're very rare, you close everyone, whatever it is, 
you should always be responding to objections with questions. Okay. A lot of advisors, a lot of salespeople in general, they respond to objections with statements like, okay, I understand. All right. Or they combat it and they actually go right after it and they try to change your mind. Those will sometimes sound like, that's not what I meant. Or that's not what I mean. Or I don't typically hear people say that. <clears throat> so we don't want to do that. We want to ask the question. And my favorite question is, again, that's interesting. What makes you say that? Because then they're going to have to tell you the root of it, the why, right? In sales, we have these objections that we handle and there's uh, what they call eggshell objections, common term for it, common phrase. It's what people want to initially say because that's usually good enough, right? You walk into a, a department store, right? You know, let's, let's say you walk in Old Navy. They walk in and they say, hey, can we help you find anything? Typically, most people will say, no, no, I'm good. Just browsing, just looking around. Okay. Those salespeople, again, they're not really true salespeople typically, but they just say, all right, well, let me know if you need anything. Okay. Again, very passive, right? Imagine if you do that in financial planning, right? Someone says, no, nah, I don't really need to maximize my social security. Or no, nah, I don't really need to talk about my financial plan. <clears throat> okay. Well, hey, if you change your mind, just let me know. Again, that's not going to earn you anything. That's not going to earn an appointment. So fire back. Oh, what makes you say that? Okay. They're going to be required to answer again. Now, required might not be the perfect term to use there. They can still choose not to respond, but most people will because it's not actually their objection. Sometimes it'll be, I really don't have time to talk about it. And that's that's another common objection. Very potentially it. But when you get to the why and you ask them that question again, <clears throat> and when I say again, by the way, that's interesting. What makes you say that? They answer, well, it's because I've got a financial advisor and I've, I'm good here. Oh, okay. Well, like, what makes you say that you're good though? Right? It can feel awkward and it can feel like you're pressuring them. But I promise you if it's done uh, organically, just through natural conversation, okay? And this does have to be face-to-face. -face. If you do this over email, text, uh, or a phone call even sometimes, it's going to feel pushy. It's not going to feel genuine. But if it's face-to-face, -face, usually it's way more genuine. And then people don't have an easy way out. They typically feel like they have to answer you. So again, what makes you say that? Get to the why, be curious, and actually listen intently to why they say that they don't need whatever it is or they don't want whatever it is, etc. Now the fourth power, uh, powerful phrase here is, I bet you're a bit like me. Okay, this is another amazing opportunity, whether it's in your sales presentations uh, or it's at your marketing, or sorry, during your marketing, at your events, you know, on your shows, etc. I bet you're a bit like me. That's going to usually forge instant camaraderie. Right? Most people, when they hear that, they're not going to stand off. Right, They're not going to become more standoffish and raise their guard up. They're actually going to lower it. Oh, I can relate to you. Right, It's also going to build a relationship uh, like as you progress like 10 times faster. Because you, you overcame the initial, uh, you know, how, you know, what do you like to do? How do you spend your time? The, the behavioral types, you know, the four types of behavior. You kind of skip past that because people already say to themselves, I know exactly what they're like, so they're a lot like me. So you're going to get ahead of that. You're also going to uh, basically provoke them in a positive way to uh, avoid the vulnerable feeling. Okay, I referenced it with bringing the guard down. When someone feels vulnerable, they typically don't want to open up strangers. Right? That's not <laughs> that's not a common thing. Uh, some people, especially men, which by the way, especially men. They don't like to open up to anyone in general, even if it's their spouse or their, their mom, their dad. So when you uh, open the conversation with, you know, I bet, you're, uh, I bet you're a lot like me or I bet you're a bit like me, you're going to allow them to actually open up and be vulnerable, vulnerable with you at a much higher rate. And that's really what we want. In the financial planning, it's, it's pretty sensitive stuff, right? Someone, they're going to tell you their life savings, their assets, their net worth, their debt, like it's, I mean, you're opening the kimono there. So again, I bet you're a bit like me. And a good example of this is, I bet that you're a bit like me and that you don't like talking about your own finances. I bet you're a bit like me 
and that you came to this a little skeptical of what it was actually about. So I'd like to ease your tension real quick. Right, again, powerful phrases that you can use throughout and you can use them multiple different ways. And so the last one here is actually how I open this entire uh, episode. There are generally two types of people. Okay, that question is a very polarizing question. And immediately when you hear that, you're going to feel like you're going to resonate with one of the two sides. Okay, it's like the A-B question, you know, which pill do you take, the red one or the blue one? People like siding with something. If you tell them there's infinite possibilities, they lose interest. But if you tell them there's a clear right or left, good, bad, yes, no, they're going to choose a side because there's really not much middle ground. So again, there are generally two types of people. People who focus primarily on minimizing their taxes so they don't pay too much to the government. Or there's people who want to maximize their social security and the payments they can receive from the government. Yeah, Generally two types of people, those who are more hands-on, do-it-yourself, DIY investors who are just looking for education, and some people who understand that they don't know it all and they don't want to know it all, so they want a professional to handle it. Right, You can fit the line in anywhere, but again, there are generally two types of people. So those are five of my favorite phrases to drive the conversation forward, the sale forward if potential. And uh, again, use with caution. They don't fit in every situation, but they're likely to aid you throughout your entire marketing and sales process. From left field, where we take a swing at answering your specific questions and share our insights into the more common challenges that financial advisors, planners, insurance agents, and brokers typically face in their business. Moving into this first left field question here, this uh, this one fits really well because I don't know if it was because of COVID specifically, but a lot of advisors and financial planners if they were in the independent space, okay, the the captive side or the wirehouse side or the agency side, they didn't really have a say in this for the most part. But on the independent side, a lot of practices sold, right? They sold their business. They said, you know, what? I'm not going to deal with this COVID thing. I'm, I'm just not going to do it. So they sold their business. What that did, I guess, long term here is what I've been experiencing is I'm getting a lot of advisors asking me questions like, I keep losing clients to the other advisor in my neighborhood. That didn't used to happen. Or, hey, my clients are leaving me to join this new advisor that just started their business. Okay, these are starting to come up a lot. And the conversation around it is typically never fun. Uh, And I say it's not fun for me because the news that I deliver to whomever's on the other side is typically not the news they want to hear. But uh, here's the answer to that. The reason why you are losing prospects. Okay, we're gonna take clients out. The reason why you're losing prospects to the other advisor in your neighborhood, or maybe it's right next door, is because he or she is not overcomplicating financial planning. They are using stories and emotion, whereas you are likely using numbers and facts and you're driving through analysis. When there's no competition, it's easy to tell people like the clear cut, black and white, here's your returns here, here's what you can expect here, here's your guaranteed income here, like you can do that. But when you add to the mix someone who does the same thing, who can offer the same thing, that's where the personality, the branding comes into play. Now branding is a bigger conversation, so again, we'll just stick with this. The other advisor is choosing not to overcomplicate it. They're finding the wedge and they're going right after it and solving that one thing. Okay, I've said this before in multiple episodes and videos. They are finding out what the most important tool is that's missing from that person's toolbox and they're just adding it. They're not trying to sell them a whole new toolbox. They're not trying to you know, uh, revive the existing toolbox. They're just giving them the one thing that they need because they know that that, that now client of theirs isn't really going to go anywhere else because they've proven their worth, at least for the short term. So that's one of the more popular reasons why people aren't working with you. But um, the other side of that coin is financial planning, again, as a whole, financial planning is doomed 
by the fact that it never becomes like it, it it can always go deeper and deeper and deeper right you can talk about simple things and i say simple uh simple for us but simple things like what is a stock versus you know an, a mutual fund what exactly is an etf like we can talk through those things but you can always go deeper and deeper and deeper right you can explain that specific stock then you can explain that specific company's financials then you can explain whether like the type of stock it is then you can explain what to expect in returns then you can explain when they announce earnings and it just on and on and on and people don't care about that typically right people want to know what time it is they don't want to know how to read the clock so a good quote and this is from Einstein actually but a good quote that I would encourage you to be thinking about just keep in the back of your head if you can't explain it in less than 60 seconds, then you shouldn't be explaining it at all. Okay. If you can't explain it in less than 60 seconds, then you shouldn't be the one explaining it at all. You still need to be learning about it. So, again, you're going to lose people to advisors around you uh, for many a multitude of reasons. But one of the more common reasons is because you are selling to the wrong type of person and you're selling it the wrong way. Now, our second question here coming in from left field, this is more of actually a rant that I got as opposed to a question, but it was, uh, you know, wholesalers and vendors and marketing companies and, and financial companies, they call me all the time and I consistently ignore them. But the ones that tend to get my attention are the ones who talk about this new software or tool that they can offer or sell me. Now, I really like them sometimes because of the data and, you know, how to use it and how it can help, etc. But is there really such a thing as too much when it comes to using reporting software and, and you know, different tools like that. So I, I, I've made my stance clear on financial planning tools and softwares in previous episodes, but their 100% is a too much. And that too much is going to be variable depending on how you build your, you know, sales process, your client deliverable, etc. But again, clients typically are not going to care about your softwares. They're not. They want to hear you say they're going to be fine or they can retire when they wanted to or they're going to hit their savings goals or they hit their, like, they just want to hear the end of it, okay? If we look at A, B, and C, A is the beginning, C is the end, B is the journey. They just want to know you'll take them from A to C. They really don't care about B typically. Now, what happens is advisors, especially the ones who are really into the software is analytical, they, you know, they want they want to run all the simulations and the analysis, and there's a place for that. I don't want to take away from that. There is a place for that in the client plan and in the sales process. But oftentimes, advisors feel like they need to have those tools, right? Like they need to have that tool that shows the income projections, or they need to have that tool that shows, you know, all the different tax components. They need to have it because they think it's valuable to the client. But the reality is, it's not valuable to the client. It is valuable to the advisor. And then the advisor is pushing that value onto the client. Again, it's the perceived value onto the client. Okay, if we switch industries here, okay, I'm going to switch industries. Let's say you're looking for cars, okay? Financial advisors are not car salesmen, so I promise I'm not saying that. But you find that, you know, let's call it a truck. I was actually just looking at trucks not too long ago. You find that truck, it looks nice, it has the mileage you're looking for, it doesn't look like there's any damage to it on the outside, but you know generally you want to use the truck for you know four-wheel drive, you want to have something you can haul those couches and all your furniture with, you want to have something that can maybe tow the boat that you're trying to buy. That's, that's why, right? That's why you want it. This is a real story that happened to me, because again, that's the reasons I wanted it, candidly. Those are the three reasons why I wanted a truck. But I found myself in a situation where the car salesman kept asking me these questions that I didn't, again, I didn't know the answer to. So they were already disconnecting there. But the questions led to statements such as, this truck will tow 3,500 pounds versus this truck that will tow 2,500 pounds. Now this truck... It'll haul these types of boats. This truck will haul those types of boats. Now, what that was, though, and I paraphrased a lot of it, but what that was 
was the car salesman on the other end listen to the thing that I said, one of the things that I said I was looking for in buying a truck. Because, you know, they ask you, what makes you want a truck? You know, what made you want to set this appointment? And they thought that it was like the most important thing, but it was really just a surface level. Right? It was just surface level. So they tried to overwhelm me with knowledge. They tried to educate me on things that I just generally didn't care about. Because at the end of the day, all I needed to know was that when I buy a boat, I can hook it up and I can tow it. Same is true in financial planning. How it happens, most people don't care about. They just care that it does happen. And then the other side of that coin actually is on a retention basis. The more tools you use, like the more evidence you give, the more analysis you give, the more statements, all that, if that client ever goes and looks at another advisor, or maybe they're shopping around and you give them those plans on the front end, the more you actually lay out, the more opportunities you create for other advisors to poke holes in it. As, as again, as elementary as this might sound, if you lay out a plan that says, let's, let's call it a, a, an income plan, right? It's an income analysis. And then you're, you know, maybe you use this already. I'm not going to say the software for, for obvious reasons, but you're using the software and it'll tell you if you continue to withdraw 5% of your money a year and you expect a 5% average market growth, you will run out of money at age 91. Okay. And that's the anchor. Like that's the anchor to the financial plan. So then you instill, uh, or I'm sorry, you propose something as an alternative. Now, when you give the client those projections, and it, it explains very, like very specifically, and I'll use that example, but that other advisor pulls in and they say, so they're telling me that it's going to be a 5% average return over you know the next 25 years. The market over the past 25 years has actually done X, Y, and Z. And then we can offset some of these potential losses by allocating this percentage into you know X, Y, Z, A, B, C, whatever. You just then created, because you gave the client all that information, you pr- proposed it all, you laid it all out with these softwares, now you have to take what that client says again, if you're lucky to have them come back to you, and then you gotta re-put in that data. You gotta do it all over again. And then on the off chance that it actually becomes uh, more beneficial to the client in their eyes, for them to not do what you initially said and do what the other person said, even though you're showing it to them, you just lost credibility. You lost leverage. So be careful with these softwares, right? Be careful with them. They have their place, they have their use, and I don't wanna downplay that, but oftentimes they're more for you than they are for the client in terms of presenting. Okay, they're more for you than they are for the client in terms of presenting the plan. So again, guys, if you have any questions, feel free, write them in, send us an email, tweet at us, uh, comment, whatever it is. Ask that question because I promise you, if you have a question, many others have the same exact question they're hoping for answers on. So thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed the Advisor Odyssey audio experience. Connect with us on your favorite social media platforms at Advisor Odyssey. You can find our full-length educational videos to watch on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. Check out all our articles and publications on medium.com forward slash Advisor Odyssey. The Advisor Odyssey podcast is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. The contents and opinions shared, expressed, or otherwise alluded to on the Advisor Odyssey podcast and audio experience are solely ideas and not to be depicted as tax, legal, or investment advice. Results from the use of these concepts may not be representative of the experience of all financial professionals and are no guarantee of future success. Your results may vary. The Advisor Odyssey and its affiliated members are not to be held liable or responsible for any lawful recourse or punishment invoked upon the individual or accompanying business partners or team members. Federal law, state law, and or insurance carrier requirements may prohibit or place limitations on any of the ideas and activities expressed. All advisors, planners, wholesalers, affiliated reps, and investment advisors should be aware of any limitations imposed by federal regulation, state regulation, insurance carriers, broker dealers, and registered investment advisors as applicable. Investment advisors are strongly encouraged to obtain pre-approval from the broker dealer, registered investment advisor, insurance company, or similar institution with which they may be affiliated.